I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I've always wanted to get into real estate. Short-term rentals is the same thing, but Airbnb is just a marketing platform. So I started kind of putting two and two together, started doing the research, and I was like, I'm going to give this a shot. Fast forward nine months, I had like 18 arbitrage Airbnb. I was making good money. I was crushing it. And then I started hanging out with bigger, higher level people. And I started realizing that what I was doing wasn't really big. I'm good at building relationships. So that's what I did. I started networking a lot. I started learning how to scale, how to build processes, how to build systems. What kind of like kept you moving? Was it just because you had this great background already i'm lazy dude i'm more of like what's the last road that i got and covid was actually a really big wake-up call for me because again i was very comfortable i was cash flowing very well i was living a really good life i was by myself but i wasn't really doing much like there was no like goal there was no future but being around these higher level people would really push me to be like yo okay now you have nothing you have to start over i just want to find good fun projects and good locations that are going to generate enough revenue and keep me excited so i'm very comfortable in my life to the point where like i'm just generating enough revenue. I don't want another job. I want to enjoy my life and do projects that I like that keep me busy. What is up, everybody? We have a very special guest with us today for the Fetch It podcast. We have Rafa Loza, the Southern California killer. How's it going, man? What's up, guys? How's it going? It's good to be here. Thank you. We appreciate you being on here, man. We appreciate you taking time. We had a little bit of a scheduling issue because of me yesterday. So we appreciate you being having uh, some flexibility with us. So Rafa, for anybody living under a rock uh, that hasn't heard about you and you killing it down in the Southern California space, please give yourself an intro and uh, kind of give us a little bit of background of how you got started in the space. Yeah. So my name is Rafa Loza. I live in Orange County, California. Uh, Southern California, and um, I've been in short-term rentals for going on seven years now, I think. Uh, real estate investing since uh, 2017. Um, I started back in September where I first wanted to get into real estate. Um, <clears throat> do you want me to go like deep into the story or just kind of give you guys like a quick background? Sure. Well, yeah, I'd uh, like to hear uh, yeah. uh, the kind of the more the origin story. That'd be cool. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I've always wanted to um, get into real estate. I, I've been um, working on different businesses growing up. And um, right around 2016, I had left a collection agency that I had built out for about two, three years. I've been in the collections game for about 10 years prior. And um, I, it, it's, it's just a really dark um draining industry and so i was like this isn't for me anymore so i left in the meantime while i was trying to figure out what to do or what direction to go with my life i started working at a casino uh, graveyard shift and um again i knew i always wanted to get into real estate so i started researching and right listening to bigger pockets and doing all the all the reading the books and the rich dad poor dad and all that stuff and um my idea was hey i'm gonna buy a property out here in southern california i'm gonna put a tenant in it and i'm just gonna be wealthy right i'm gonna retire rich <laughs> Um, and, and, uh, obviously that wasn't the case. Um, the houses down here at that time were like 450 grand. I just couldn't afford to buy one. Um, I left with about 20 K in my pocket when I left that collection agency. And so as I was working at the casino, my money started kind of going down because my expenses were high and I wasn't making as much. And so I came across, uh, short-term rentals, Airbnb at the same time. I didn't know that, that short-term rentals were Airbnb at the time. And, um, there was a, a, a kid or two guys, I don't even remember, who were driving like some Ferrari and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, we 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 do Airbnb. We rent out a bunch of apartments in a building. And I was like, that, how do you guys do that? Like, is that allowed? And they're like, yeah, well, we, we haven't told the manager, but, you know, I don't think we're going to get caught. And I was like, all right, well, I'm not trying to do that. Right. <laughs> but then I realized, wait, short term rentals is the same thing, but Airbnb is just a marketing platform. So I started kind of putting two and two together, started doing the research. And I was like wait a second. So I don't even need to buy property. I can actually rent someone's property out and I can furnish it and put it on Airbnb. And I was like, okay. And my cost to get this started was extremely low and I can cash flow a ton of money as I started doing the research. And I was like, I'm going to give this a shot. So six, seven months of research, um, reading, learning. Um, I went up to an apartment complex and they had about, uh, it was 110 or something and they had about 67 units vacant. And I was like, Hey, I have this idea. I want to rent out your apartment. Um, and I want to lease it a, a long-term tenant and I want to put it on Airbnb. And the lady was like, well, can you pay the rent? And I was like, yeah, I can. And so, um, you know, I showed her a bank account with like five grand in it. And she's like, um, are you sure you can pay the rent? I was like, well, that's the rent and the deposit. So I'll give you first month's rent and I'll give you deposit. And then we'll go from there. And she's like, okay, cool. They had vacancy to fill. So she's like, yeah. Um, I go, I call my brother and I was like, Hey dude, I, I've got this, uh, this business idea. Uh, let's partner up. I need to borrow your credit card cause I need to furnish this apartment. 
And so he let me borrow his credit card. So I started this business with 5K and a $9,000 credit card. My chair's moving all over the place here. And so um, that's what I did. We got it furnished. It took us about two and a half weeks to get it furnished and set up. And the second week, I made 6K. And I was like, holy crap, this is a real thing. It was a two-bath two, two bath apartment. And so the following month was Christmas, and I made 6K in profit. And I pretty much, I mean, I doubled my 5K investment. And so... Um, I was were like, you like, were you like, I'm never doing anything else. This is the only thing I'm ever going to do. Literally, well, so literally I was like, I, I'm going all in on this. I mean, I just made more money in one month than I did on my job. And I had to do nothing other than answer a few guest messages. And um, all it cost me was a credit card and $5,000 in cash. So yeah, I was like, I'm going in. And so then as, as the apartment complex started seeing how well I was doing, how beautiful we made their place look, they just kept offering me more units. Um, and then I started looking for other locations and I found another brand new build apartment con uh, complex. I was brand new construction, completely empty. Took a couple units there. Fast forward nine months, I had like 18 arbitrage um, Airbnbs. I didn't even know they were called arbitrage, right? I just knew they were Airbnb. And so I was like, cool. Um, and then I got really lazy. I got comfortable. I was making good money. I was, I was crushing it. In my eyes, I was crushing it, right? My circle, I was crushing it. And um, then I started hanging out with like bigger, higher level people. Um, and I started realizing that what I was doing wasn't really big. It's just, I didn't know anything, but I was cash flowing really well. Um, and it kind of opened my eyes a little bit. And around that time, COVID hits and I'm hanging out with these guys. Uh, and they're like, Hey dude, if you're really good at something, you should stick to it and just perfect it and just keep going at it. And I was like, well, you know, I'm good at short-term rentals, but I don't want to do short-term rentals anymore. And we're at this time of COVID where like, I don't know what's going to happen. And the owner where I was at in one of my buildings, at that point, I think I had like 23 or 24, I don't even remember the number, um, short-term rentals. And he sold the building and I had to get out of it. And so I ended up closing down all these units. I had about three units left. Um, this was right after COVID was ending. And um, this COVID actually had already ended. Like it, everything was kind of coming back up again. And so I had three units left. I had all this furniture sitting in storage. And that's when I thought about it. I was like, well, you know, I am good at this. I wanted to get into house flipping and I wanted to get into like different aspects of real estate. By this point, I already knew about like wholesaling and like all this other like avenues of real estate. But I was like, I'm really good at the short term rental piece. Why not just continue to do it? And I'm good at building relationships. So that's what I did. I started networking a lot again, um, going to events and talking to people. And I met a bunch of other investors who were willing to give up their properties to me. And so I, I went from three units uh, post COVID to... I took over a 12 unit building instantly and I had all this furniture sitting around. So I, I, you know, I bought some new stuff. I used some old stuff. Um, I took over a 24 unit building. I took over a bunch of single families and fast forward I, it, within the year, I had about 76 new short term rentals. And so I just scaled it significantly. Um, by this point, I started learning how to scale, how to build processes, how to build systems. I found a mentor that taught me that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, man, I decided to join some, some high end networking because I realized, wait a second, I'm still, even though I'm doing well in my circle, I'm not doing very well in comparison to everybody else, right? I might have all these short-term rentals, but I don't own a single piece of property. Um, and I, I'm talking to these dudes, like I'm hanging out with guys that have like hundred millions of dollars in real estate. And I have zero dollars in real estate, but I'm cash flowing 10 times more than what they're cash flowing. And so there was this attraction of like, holy crap, you're cash flowing this much money, but you have this, like this property. We have this much property, but we're cash flowing this much money. So it was like, so we started talking, hanging out, and um, then I started going to higher level mastermind groups, networking, um, fast forward to, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, I uh, met some business partners, and that's when I really escalated, and I said, hey, I'm going to take this serious. Now I'm in the boutique hotel space. I own a boutique hotel. I have a second one under contract. I just bought a 40-acre ranch in um, uh, Southern California that we're going to convert it to a full resort. Um, I actually got a creative finance deal on that one because, uh, long story, we can get into it in the future if you guys want. Um, but now I have a bunch of short-term arbitrage rentals. I own a couple of vacation rentals. Um, and yeah, man, here we are sitting down chatting about it. So long story, but you know, that was a whole, whole purpose. No, that's phenomenal, man. I remember, uh, whenever I first heard you on the bigger pockets podcast and I remember you talking or telling that story and yeah, you were up to like 16 grand in cash flow in no time. I was like, holy shit, that's crazy. And, uh, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know about the, you know, the peak and then the trough and then the peak again, now that you've come your way back up. So yeah, how was how was that whenever you like, you know, you were kicking ass and then COVID comes in and kicks some ass and then you had to like try and work your way back up? I mean, what kind of like kept you moving? Why didn't you like pivot to wholesaling or pivot to something else? Was it just because you had this great background already? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, dude. So 
Um, honestly, it was, I got complacent and comfortable. And so, um, I wasn't like in my eyes, I was crushing it, but I really wasn't crushing it. Um, what made me really continue down this path is that number one, I had all this furniture sitting around. Um, <laughs> number two, I had the knowledge and I'm really good at networking and building relationships. Like I'm just, I'm naturally good at building relationships with people. And so, um, talking to these guys that, when he when he brought it up and it wasn't even like he was directing it to me he was just talking to somebody in a group that i was with and he's like you know if you're good at something just stick to it and perfect it again and i was like well okay but i don't want to do short-term rentals anymore i want to get better at something else mm. and then i thought about it and i was like well you know everybody's doing this wholesale game and it's like there's a bunch of legalities and you got to go out and do a bunch of work and i'm lazy dude I, like i'm more of like what's the last road that i got like the most paved road right the easiest road to travel and so I was like, well, this is easy for me. And it's a, it's minimal work because I, I'm building the team. And so um, that made me really be like, hey, get back into it. Start opening more units up. Um, and being around these higher level people really pushed me to do more. Because even though like COVID was actually a really a, a big wake up call for me. Because again, I was very comfortable. I was cash flowing very well. I was living a really good life. I was by myself. Um but I wasn't really doing much. Like there was no like goal. There was no future. It was just like, Hey, as things come along, I'll do them. But being around these higher level people is what really pushed me to be like, yo, okay, now you have nothing. You have to start over. Which direction do you want to go? Well, again, going back to, I'm just good at short term rentals. I said, Hey, I'm just going to stick with this. And yeah, I, I kind of, I blew it up. Um, it was tough. Don't get me wrong. I had to do a ton of networking. I had to build a lot of good relationships. I had to deal with a lot of regulations. Um, but honestly, it was one of the best things that could have happened because I've built so many good relationships now. Um, I've raised a ton of private capital. I've raised, I mean, I've, I've built a bunch of locations. I have a bunch of partners everywhere. Um, but it, it was getting my mindset right to the point where I was like, hey, don't get comfortable. Don't get lazy. Just keep going, right? And now I just do projects that excite me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah. So like you, you mentioned building out teams. I mean, like uh, most people, they're afraid to hop into short term rentals just because like, oh, the communication on one property. And then you say 77. It's like, holy cow. Like, I can't imagine the amount of like messages, cleaners, all that going in and out. I mean, like, do you have like VAs? Do you have people on the ground? What's kind of your team structure look like for anybody that's wanting to look to scale? Yeah. So um, it's funny. I went to 18 units before I hired my first virtual assistant for my guest communications team. Wow. And I did it because it was like becoming just like this nightmare. And I'm more of like, again, remember, I'm lazy. Right. And I mean that in a way where like I want to find ways to clear up my time so that I can do what I want to do with my time. Right. I don't want to sit there and have to do all the work. It's going to cost me money, but at least it frees up my day. And so um, when I figured out how to start hiring virtual assistants, I, I was like, OK, this is a real thing. And again, remember, I started learning about scaling and automation and processes and systems and all that stuff. Right. Creating SOPs. Um, so yes, to, to answer your question, I have virtual assistants who are my entire guest communication team. Um, I don't know, like really, I call them virtual assistants cause that's what they are, but they're part of my team. They're like engraved in my team. They're, 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 if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be running my business. Um, so I owe them a lot. Um, but I have six virtual assistants. I have now an, a COO. Um, she manages all my day to day stuff. And um, I have a ton of cleaners. We have one full-time cleaner that we pay hourly. Um, I have a lot of 1099 cleaners who we pay per job. And then I have a linen company that I work with. Um, so, you know, right now it's just a full team. My job is just to grow the business and just kind of oversee everything, making sure everybody's doing their job. Hey, how's this going? Hey, how's that going? What happened here? Um, things like that. But pretty much the entire business from guest communications, guest relations, um, claims, um, processing payments, all of that stuff is done by my virtual assistants. And then all the day-to-day -day stuff on the boots on the ground in terms of pricing things correctly, making sure we're fully booked, uh, talking and communicating, making sure things are being communicated back and forth with cleaners, my virtual assistants, all the automation software is done by my COO. Gotcha. So like what kind of stuff? Uh, so I mean, it sounds like you've basically outsourced the entire thing to where like, which, you know, you're, you built yourself out of the business, which is the dream. That's what you're supposed to do. And so what kind of things like do you actually like what, what actually comes through? Like, hey, what are the things that only Rafa can do and we need to go to him to do this? Or have you tried to basically get rid of it sounds like, you know, basically networking because nobody can network like Rafa can network. So what other things maybe uh, are like, hey, only I can do this in the business? Yeah. So, um, I can do everything in the business, but I don't want it. I don't do nor want to do anything in the business. So I have levels, right? So there's level one where it's like, 
uh, something happens, it goes to my VA. She can't handle it, then it goes to my main VA, my manager VA. She can't handle it, it goes to my COO. If she has questions and doesn't know how to do it, it hits me. And okay. then I just tell her how to solve it. Um, that's that's the level in terms of like how I get involved in, in day-to-day stuff for the business. But my thing that I really do is grill the business, which is go and find new locations, um, go and, and look at new deals, go and network and build relationships to raise capital or to build a partnership or to acquire a property. So it's literally anything that, that is required to grow the business, that's where I come in. Um, I don't delegate the work for acquisitions because I'm not trying to scale that fast. I want to scale with really good properties now. So I've, I've cut back, actually. I've, I've toned it down a lot to what we're going. I don't open any more arbitrage units anymore. I just want to find good, fun projects and good locations that are going to generate enough revenue and keep me excited and where I can build a team. And that's what I do. Um, I, I just oversee everything. I make sure that the team's properly working. Uh, we have weekly meetings. We go over calls. I actually have a call with my my staff, my team, after this this recording today, where we're just going to oversee how the week went. Where are we? What happened? What are our claims looking like? What do our reviews look like? How's our guest communication looking? All of that stuff. Rafa, that's that's amazing. I, I have one mini question, and then I want to get into the into the motel thing for a second. I uh, just selfishly want to know, is your, CEO, is, is your COO um, in the Philippines also? Is your COO stateside? Uh, okay. And then, the yes. se- and, and, then the second, and then the second question is, um, tell, us how you, tell us about the motel, how you got into it, some details about the deal, how you overcame maybe, maybe it's, I don't know how you did it, but you made the mental leap to go from, I'm an arbitrage guy into like, I mother, mm -mm, I don't want to bleep it out, own motels now. Like, how did you, how did you swag up? How did you level up? Um, And how, was it the numbers? Like, give it to, give it to us. Yeah. So um, first question. Yeah. She's local. She lives, she lives here in in Southern California. Um, So the hotel thing was a no brainer for me. I'm taking over apartment complexes and converting the entire thing to a short term rental. That's basically already running as a hotel, Right. All my systems and processes are in place. The only thing I also, one of the other things that I also do is I go to the locations and I record all the footage needed to send to my virtual assistants. And then we have a day training with them so that they know everything that's going on. Or I just send a bunch of videos explaining things. Otherwise, they won't know how to respond to guests. Um, But the hotel thing was a no-brainer for me. So I was at a networking event at a mastermind. And I was talking about my story just like I'm talking to you guys. And these two kids walk in and they're asking me all these questions. And then they're like, dude, you must be super busy. And I'm like, actually, I have a ton of free time and I'm trying to find something to keep me busy now. Um, and he's like, what, what do you mean? And I, was, I explained it. I was like, well, I, don't, I just oversee the, 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 the business. I'm working two, three hours a week. No joke. And he was like, what? He's like, I'm busy all the time. We have two short-term rentals and it keeps us busy all the time. And I was like, I started talking to him. I was like, look, implement this, use this software, price this way, automate this, automate that. And they're like, okay, thanks. And they started taking notes. That was it. It was a quick conversation, five, 10 minutes. That was the end of it. They walk away. We're, you know, again, mastermind. This is a commercial mastermind. So this is like a high level mastermind. Everybody there's very wealthy, doing very well. They own a bunch of commercial real estate. And so a few weeks, a few weeks pass by and this kid calls me, the same kids that we ran into, uh, that I ran into at this event. He's like, hey, dude, we got a hotel coming up. Uh, we're, we're talking to a bunch of people who we want to operate um, and we think you're perfect for the job. And we'd like to see if you'd want to partner up with us in this deal where you run operations we do acquisitions, we do all the setup, we deal with all the capital raising, and you just become a partner. And I was like, okay, well, what does that look like? He's like, well, you get equity, you'll get this much, zero money in the deal, um, and you get this percentage, and we negotiated kind of like a percentage for me to manage. And I was like, why would you guys offer me that? That makes no sense. And he's like, well, because we want to you to do what you do with us in the business. And I was like, yeah, F yeah, I'm in, right? I was like, of course. Um, to me, I'm thinking like, I, I know how I know how partnerships work, but I'm thinking, why call me? Because again, this limited belief where I'm thinking like, this is just what I do for like, for my, it's not for fun, but it's kind of like fun for me. I, to me, in my head, I'm just going to be like, well, once it's up and running, I just got to plug and play it to my business and I don't have to do anything else. And you're giving me all this. I don't know. I, like, I just couldn't comprehend, like, why would you be willing to offer that? But then I realized, okay, look, the, the value that I provide is, is a lot, right? People don't know operations. People don't have the teams built out the way I have them built out. People don't have the processes and systems in place like I have them. 
And so I said, yeah, we partnered up. Um, we, we got together. We rehabbed the entire hotel. I went up there. Um, we spent some time working on the hotel. I was recording things as I needed to record, doing things that I needed to do. And um, here we are now. Hotels in full operations. We're crushing it. I think it did about um, 380K the last three months um, oh my in the gosh. summer months. It's, it's just it's doing really, really well. So um, aside from that, you know, here we are. Hey, can if do you guys edit this later? Uh, we can. Yeah, mix can. Yeah. Okay, cool. I just I was just wondering because, um, in case something happens, I don't want to be like, oh shoot, pause it or whatever. But I guess I just <laughs> stopped it anyway. Huh? My bad. So don't, okay, cool. Don't even worry about it. We like you being real anyway. Um, yeah. uh, dude, I I have a question. Um, Rafa, yeah. do motels, hotels? I, I don't know what word we're using right now. Do the entities that you acquired get around a Airbnb short term rental regulation? Like, Ooh, does that it, is a good question. Yeah, because because um, I'm obsessed with that topic for a lot of reasons. I'm I'm yeah. building in this in the Smokies, and then uh, David and I are going to be doing Sedona together. And mm-hmm. we always think about regulations. We're like, can we do this? And are we going to get kiboshed? That's why we pick these areas so we don't get around it. But once you start talking motels and hotels, doesn't that completely like you can go to L.A., you can go to Miami, you can go to Fort Lauderdale. I mean, I'm not saying we would, but you can. Right. So um, most motels and hotels are zoned hospitality. So if they're zoned hospitality, you don't have to deal with any regulation because that's what they're meant for. That's that's the location. So even if there is regulation, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect you. Um, some commercial some commercial zones have a special uh, case usage. There's a few places like that where they're they're um, used as multifamily, but you can use them as short term rentals because it's a it's a mixed use code um, in the zoning. So, um, but if hotel to answer the question, yes, hotels and motels, as long as they're zoned commercial hospitality, you're golden. You don't have to deal with anything. Dude, Amazing. I, I don't Amazing. know how I've never like that's never clicked in my brain. Like, oh yeah, you just like you can't do Airbnbs in Las Vegas or whatever. But if you buy some dinky little motel that's you know zoned for hospitality then you're good. And if you just so happen to book out the majority of your motel from Airbnb, who cares? It's, you know, it's just short term rental regulations versus what it's zoned for that. That's an incredible, like, that's like so stupid. It's so right in front of your face, but you don't even think about it. That's incredible, man. So, um, whenever you pick this, picked up this, uh, um, hotel, how many units or like how many rooms is it currently? And then like, do you guys have like a uh, um, kind of a buy box that you're looking for right now? Is like, there's something that too small, too big, like where do you guys kind of like to find yourself? So the first, the first one, the Bay Inn up in, up in North Michigan, um, that one was a 15 unit block, but it came with a three bedroom house, a studio and a cabin or a lodge that wasn't being used. So that was an instant value add for us. Um, when we went to go see it, and when they pitched it to me, I was like, why aren't they using this? Um, the, the old owners lived on the house. The studio was for when family visited, and the lodge was for when other extra people visited, like friends and family. So I was like, they're just it's just blocked. I was like, that's instant revenue being added. Um, so we converted it to an 18-unit style um, hotel. You can book every single one individually on its own, or you can book, book out the entire thing. Um, and, and, you know, whenever you go and look for a deal for us, you just want to make sure it's a value add deal. Is there an office space? The one that we have right now up in Northern California, I partnered up with someone different. Um, we're negotiating that one right now, actually. Uh, we're trying to get hundred percent seller finance on that deal. That one. Would it um, happen to be partnering with your po- uh, podcast co-host in Northern California? Would you? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I was just curious, you and Jesse. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. Me and Jesse haven't partnered on anything yet. Maybe in the future we will. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to get him to invest on my ranch deal. So maybe he sees, hears this, there we watches go. this, and, and does it. But anyway, um, so he uh, this this has this this hotel up up north has a kitchen and a bar, and I don't I'm not I don't want to get in the food service industry, nor do I want to lease it out. So we're gonna tear it apart and add more rooms to it. Mm. So I'm always looking for a way where I can generate more revenue. Um, with my business partners in Michigan, we were partnering up on a second one. It fell through because of some legal reasons. Uh, we had it under contract and it just didn't pan out. Um, and then we had a third one and same thing. Numbers didn't make sense. The owner was being kind of like a little crazy. So we backed out of it. Now they're doing their own deals. Um, they, it's difficult for me because I live in Southern California. They live over there. 
Um, they partner together a lot. And so wherever they need help with operations and management, I'll come in and help them. Otherwise, they do their own stuff and I do my own stuff here or we'll find something to partner together. Um, like I was trying to get them in the ranch deal down here in Southern California, but it didn't work out because they're over there and I'm in California. Right. So different things. Um, we're really good friends now. We hang out all the time. But um, to go back to your question, I'm getting sidetracked here. The buy box is anywhere from 10 to 40, 40 rooms. Um, anything under $10 million in vacation rental markets. They got to be drive to destinations, not drive through destinations or not um, random like spots. What does that mean? What does that mean? Get very specific. Get very specific. Give me like your favorite one. So that way people know what that what that means. Give me your favorite market. that fits. Well, so I'll give you an example for you. You're investing in the Smokies. That's a drive to destination. Right. The Great Lakes up north Michigan. That's a drive to to destination right i don't have to drive through a random city to stay there right that's what i'm talking about so to give you a market i mean i don't have a favorite market i look at any vacation rental market um north carolina is one of my favorite places right now i'm looking to invest out there uh my buddy dan tollins out there owns a bunch of hotels um on carolina beach so you know maybe i'll go out there we're, we're talking about partnering on a deal together um lake tahoe is, is a, a place that i like i mean you know there's different locations there's a, uh, something that might interest you. There's something else that we had another guest on the podcast, his company, they create tiny homes. And he said that what some of their mm -hmm. uh, clients were doing, they find like the little, like in these destinations, like you're talking about, like somewhere like in and around Asheville or something like that. It, it, for you to find a piece of land and, you know, get it rezoned commercial to then build like a tiny home village, like everybody dreams about doing. He said, yeah. instead, what you should be doing is going out and finding like a 10 pad trailer park or a 15 pad trailer park. It's already zoned. It's already got the infrastructure. Yank all them crappy old trailers out of there and you can probably get it for a pretty decent price because, you know, if, if it's a smaller piece, nobody, none of the big players are looking for it. And then you can throw in, you know, a bunch of small tiny homes or something like that and plug it into the short term rental world because it's zoned commercial. So that, the, whenever yeah. you were talking about those kind of markets, that, that popped up in my head. Yeah. So I actually have a, a buddy of mine who uh, he does a ton of RV parks. Mm -hmm. And now he's getting into the resort style RV par parks. Um, actually, the ranch that I, I just picked up down here, we're putting in 15 tiny homes. Nice. So, you know, it's going to be a full resort style. I don't like to deal with any of the rezoning nonsense because it's just a delay. Carrying costs get out of control and it's a nightmare to do. You, rezoning something is just near impossible. Mm -hmm. So I look for the places where we can already have it set up as what we need it to be. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever you're like looking for these, uh, looking for these properties, I mean, I know that you're, you know, you're a whiz with, uh, with, you know, networking and finding people and having people bring deals into you. But is there, I mean, other than, you know, like LoopNet or something, is there a spot that you kind of like to try and find and like figure out where these properties are that you might be, you know, like, a like the place that you found for your resort and stuff like that? Is there a certain area that you like to look at? Or like like a way to source them, I should say. So yeah, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I don't source anything, dude. <laughs> I don't I don't have an acquisitions team. That's not look. Remember, I told you I'm not trying to scale drastically. Um, I I I there was a point in my life where I was like, I gotta grow, I gotta do more, do more, do more, do more, do more, do more, and then I just it's like a dog chasing his tail, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm never gonna catch up. So I'm very comfortable in my life to the point where like I'm generating enough revenue. I just want to generate enough revenue to make my life a little bit more comfortable. If there's something I want, like right now, my goal is I want to buy a boat, right? And so in order to buy a boat, I need to raise my income. And by raising my income, I need to buy a couple of properties. And then buy these couple of properties, they got to be very specific properties. They're going to number one, excite me. They're in a very good vacation rental market and they're going to cash flow me money. Mm -hmm. So I don't have an acquisitions team looking all the time because I don't want another job. I want to enjoy my life and do projects that I like that keep me busy. And so my thing is um, networking and talking about things like this with you guys and people listen to me and my word, my name, my name and my voice gets out there and people just throw deals at me. And that's where I'm like, oh, I like that one. Oh, I like that one. Oh, I like that one. And then that's where we start going. Um, because otherwise, you know, and it's not that I'm against it. I just don't want to do it because, again, I don't want another job. Um, and I want to make my life comfortable and I enjoy my life. So I just want to be able to live a good life. Um, and the deals that I get, the deals that I acquire come from everybody within my network and my circle that are like, Hey, Rafa, I got this deal. Um, do you want to work on it with us? Or, Hey, Rafa, there's this deal. What do you think? Let's partner up on it. Literally everything that I own, dude, I've partnered up on everything. Um, even the arbitrage stuff, if it wasn't for a partnership with the owners, I wouldn't have. 
So yeah. I, now, like right now, I'm looking to buy a property in Escondido with someone. And he's like, hey, I got this loan. I buy it. You teach me short-term rentals. We go 50-50. And I was like, yeah, I'd be happy to teach you. And it's a great property, right? And I was like, that's exciting. Now I get to work with someone new. I don't like to do the whole like mentor and coaching stuff because it's very draining. But if I work with someone that we're actually going to own something together, he came to me with everything in place already. I got the loan. I got the, the qualification. I'm going to help you find the property. I just need you to help me learn how to acquire more and how to run them. Yeah. Cool. I love that. Cool. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Love that, man. So, um, uh, prior to you, like initially getting into your arbitrage game and stuff like that, um, like how big has social media been with that? And like, how, how have you helped to grow that? Because I know that that's kind of, you know, in the real estate world, that's a very big thing because for one, you know, people like to do deals with people they know, like, and trust. And so you need to get yourself out there. So, um, like can you touch on like the social media side of things a little bit. Yeah, man. So, you know, when I first started speaking about short-term rentals, it was on the clubhouse days, right, during the COVID time. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's actually how I got on Bigger Pockets because I met Tony there and we became friends. Mm. Uh, and he invited me to come on to Bigger Pockets. Um, so I was supposed to be on the rookie one and they ended up putting me on the main one as like a takeover, right, when like Brandon was leaving. Um, and and so that's when I realized social media has a big impact in, in, in where you go. Um, if it wasn't for me speaking on a social media platform like Clubhouse, nobody would know who I was. I'd just be another dude who's working in the background, right? Which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I have friends who are doing way better than me, even in the arbitrage space, and they want nobody to know about it. They just want to keep grinding and hustling and doing their thing. Um, but I've gotten so many opportunities through social media that to me, it was like, well, I got to keep going on this. Otherwise, like, what am I doing? Right now, we have a full-time, um, like I have a full-time person that edits videos for me who helps get things out here, out there for me on, on Instagram, because I want people to know who I am in case like, for example, if I need to raise capital, I had a guy, I was at a party. My dog's going crazy out here. So I, I had a party. Name again? I, I, I remember seeing him from Instagram. He's this got a funny right name. Doesn't he? Yeah. Rain. His name's Rain. Rain. He's got a little <laughs> rock back here. Um, so uh, hold on guys. Let me get someone to take him out. I think he's going crazy. <laughs> no problem. Sorry. So uh, to give you an example, back to where we were talking about, um, I was at a, at a birthday party with a bunch of friends and somebody was overheard me talking about my investment deals and how I've been raising capital and, and taking people's money and stuff like that and, and investing them and giving them good returns and all that fun stuff. And he's like, hey, dude, I just sold the property a couple like, you know, eight, nine months ago. And, you know, the way the market is right now, I don't want to reinvest. And I was like, well, bro, I was like, come on over. Let's chat. Right. And then he's like, well, I just I, I've been watching all your social media. And that was instant credibility instant credibility. Mm -hmm. And so in my head, I'm like, again, if it wasn't for social media, nobody know who I was. If somebody listening to this goes, well, I wonder who this Rafa guy is. And then they go on my Instagram, they're going to start scrolling through my feed and all the stuff that I dropped, they're going to go, oh crap, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And then it's instant credibility. That's the way social media is. And that's the way I use it. And I want people that know me, that like me, and now they trust me because they see that I actually know what I'm talking about. For sure, man. I love that. Yeah. Ryan Pineda, he's kind of been like, uh, like the, the poster child for how, how big social media can have an impact on somebody's company. Cause yeah, I mean, like you, you can't get on social media without seeing, well, especially whenever the algorithm's feeding you all these real estate people, but you know, like you can't get on there without seeing Pineda and like seeing Brandon Turner and seeing all these other people. And they know that, you know, eyeballs eventually convert into whether it's them bringing you a deal and they want a partner or them being a private money lender and wanting to give you cash. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's massive, man. Um, so I guess I, I now just had a, something pop in my head that I should have asked earlier um, with the arbitrage world. You said you're not really picking up any more arbitrage, and it seems like there's a lot of people jumping in and then a lot of people are now jumping ship. Do you think the arbitrage is still like a good model for somebody getting started? Or do you think that they should work with, you know, trying to find a partner? Or what do you think about arbitrage now? Um, I think arbitrage is very saturated now in specific markets because everybody's getting in thinking that you can still cash flow what you used to cash flow. And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, only and. and with that, very specific markets will still absolutely crush. Southern California, not one of them anymore, right? My, mm. my city where I'm at, no longer one of them. Um, so many people got in. I, you know, plus I talked about it a ton, so a lot of people followers here. Um, but uh, different markets around the country, people are still getting in and they're crushing, making a ton of money. But you got to know that market and you got to know the demand and you got to see you know, it's a risk, but it's a very low risk, right? You're going to risk 10, 15 K as opposed to buying a property where you're risking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think it's still very, a, a very good strategy. Yes. For someone starting. Yes. Because you'll learn the market, right? You might not make as much money as you used to be able to, but at least you're learning 
the space. You're learning how to manage. You're learning how to deal with guests. You're learning how to build uh, teams, how to deal with processes, how to like, you're learning everything in the game. So um, the cash flow isn't as high. It's a little bit lower now, but depends on what you're going for, right? If you still want to cash flow a couple hundred bucks a month and learn the business, I think it's a great strategy for sure. So, so thanks. So that's super interesting. So you, you're not doing more arbitrage You'd be, and people should be selective about that beyond getting a boat and beyond being selective about your deals. Where do you see yourself going in the next few years? Um, I personally love that you, you don't force the issue. You don't force looking for deals. You don't force trying to work too hard, but you know, and in, in a weird sort of roundabout way, it's blessed you in return in, in, in a roundabout way. Tell us a little bit about like where you, where you would love to go because you're not back in the, you're not back in your early days trying to figure out like, Oh, um, what's my career going to be. You have a great career. So like, what does somebody with a great career who owns a bunch of deals with partners want to do in a few years? Like, yeah. And, and so to clarify, dude, it doesn't mean I'm not trying to grind and grow. I am. I'm just not doing it in a way where I feel like I'm just rushed to do so. Right. I have a few goals right now. One is to replace all my arbitrage units with owned properties. That's the first one. Right. Number two, I want to generate enough cash flow to be able to live the life that I want to live without any cost for concern. Um, and the minimum goal for me to do that is 33 K passively a month. Right. Um, and then I have a goal to generate the exact same amount as a hundred percent true passive by investing in other people's deals. Hmm. That's the second part. Um, in five years, I see myself doing what I'm doing now, man, finding in exciting projects that I know will make me happy and excite me. Um, not chasing after, you know, the thousand doors. I'm not chasing after the, the millions and millions in real estate. I'm just chasing after my, what, what excites me and keeps me actually motivated to wake up in the mornings, um, where I come in and I work with my team for a couple hours, um, where I, I can add good properties and locations where I want to travel to, um, where I can partner with good people who are friends with me, who we can partner together and work together and do things together and have fun together. Um, but the biggest thing is, yeah, I want to replace all of my arbitrage. That's, that's the actual goal. Um, I want to replace the, all the arbitrage units with owned properties. Love that, man. Love that. Yeah. That's, uh, um, uh, I, w I always tell people this. I wish I, t I coined the term a lifestyle investor. And it seems like you're very much so a lifestyle investor to where like, you're not going to take some deal just because it might be a killer deal. But if it takes up, you know, 80% of your time during the week, you're not going to do it. You want to be focusing on investments that work around the lifestyle you want, not, you know, trying to work your lifestyle around this business that you ended up building. So I love that, man. Um, so I'm going to start uh, working into some of the closing questions. And one, uh, we've talked about a ton of deals so far today, uh, but I want to bring you back to whatever, whatever one, whenever you think back in your head was the one, what was your favorite deal that you've done so far in the past where you're like, man, that, that one was it. It's this or it could be a current deal. deal. It's this wrench deal that I'm, I'm on right yeah. now. <laughs> That's so, what I was curious. Um, yeah. It's, it, this wrench deal is just so, so, I mean, it's so exciting, dude. Like uh, the, the, <laughs> You know what, guys? Can can we put this on hold for a second? This dog. Sure, won't no stop problem, barking. man. <laughs> Sorry, guys. One second. No, you're good, man. He's got a little English bulldog. It's, it's back there trying to bark. <laughs> Yeah, Yoni, that was a great question, man, uh, about getting skirting short term uh, regulations. I never even thought of that, dude. Just trying to because uh, I've been thinking in my head. About the future. Mm -hmm. And the markets that have regulations are also kind of awesome. Yeah, yeah. So there's a reason that there's regulations because everybody's trying to get into them. Um, but yeah, man, if you could start sneaking into some of these markets where, you know, I need, it, it definitely is becoming a thing where people are talking about, you know, oh, I want to get into the boutique motel space. Like, it seems like a lot of people are saying that, but how many people are actually in that space, like actually trying to do something about it? Probably a pretty small handful of people. And imagine so owning, imagine owning a motel in Southern California and all your units on Airbnb. Yeah. Exactly right, man. Or, you know, or somewhere like, you know, Asheville, North Carolina, or, you know, along the Great Lakes, whatever. 
All right, dude. Sorry, boys. Normally, no, my girlfriend no will take him out, but she's not here right now. And I was like, dude, this guy's like barking nonstop. <laughs> You're so, cool, man. Um, I don't want him interrupting the rest of the conversation. Sure. So, uh, yeah, question. So, uh, like, looking forward to the future, what is what is the project that you think is really, like, exciting to you? What do you think is going to or, or, uh, what or what projects in the past, I mean? What has been the favorite deal that you've done so far? Yeah. So, uh, it's this ranch deal that I'm in right now. Um, it, it's... It, it's everything I've always wanted to do, right? Uh, I'm an, it's got, so this is a 40 acre ranch in Escondido, California, about an hour north of, of San Diego, hmm. um, about 45 minutes from the beach. Um, it's, it's enough to where you drive out in and be far away from society, enjoy the, the outdoors, or be close enough to just drive straight to the beach if needed for, you know, an hour or two. Um, it's, it's got four houses on site. It's got a wedding venue. Uh, mm -hmm. we're going to convert the houses into luxury short term rentals, but also make them exclusive to the wedding parties. If they want to book them for lodging, um, we're going to build a speakeasy into it. We're building an, a, a, uh, an entire resort. So it's going to have a pool. It's going to have uh, a sauna. It's going to have, you know, the, the steam room, the jacuzzis, the cold plunge, like everything in it. And then it's got glamping. So a whole section of it is glamping. So we're going to build a bunch of glamping tents. We're building an actual tree house on it. And um, we're adding four more properties onto it as ADUs. And then we're going to add 15 tiny houses, uh, 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 not ground up construction. Those are going to be above ground tiny houses. It's going to be 15 of them. It's a three year project. And this thing's going to just, it's going to be a killer deal once it's done. Um, it's a ton of work, um, but it's going to cash flow just ridiculous. And this is one of these trophy properties where in like 15 years, I'm going to be like, dude, come check this place out. You know, and then um, and then the beautiful thing, too, is like if you're if you're cash flowing that well, like then, you know, the thing that a lot of people don't understand, especially like if they're just into arbitrage or just into single families, like once you start getting into these commercial spaces, your NOI is going to be through the roof on this thing. And you divide that over a cap rate. I mean, this property is going to be worth an astronomical amount of money with the way that I know that you guys are going to run it. It's going to be, you know, cash flowing like crazy. So do you guys have any sort of like potential predictions on what you think it could be valued at once you're done? So not on the full amount because we didn't account for the wedding revenue. I didn't want to mm. account for it because that's just going to be icing on the cake, nor did I add the tiny houses. All I accounted for was the four houses, um, two tiny houses, uh, and the um, the tree house. And in three years, it should be valued at 5.4. So, you know, and right now it's worth 2.3. Um, so it's going to double in value for sure. But once we add everything else to it and we actually account for all the revenue it's generating, I mean, even at a... Down there, it's like a four and a half cap. It, this thing's going to be worth upwards of nine to 10. Easy. That's fantastic, man. Yeah. I love that. And then, you know, you start digging into these small motels and hotels and stuff. Same situation, you know, because you they're getting all, you know, a um, hundred bucks a night as a so-so a hotel. But then you turn it into a super, you know, luxe Airbnb experience. Then you're getting, yeah. you know, 250, 300 a night. You've just tripled your value of the property. It's incredible, man. I love that yeah. model. Yeah, we're actually active. So speaking of never looking, I'm actually actively looking with a, another partner that I'm going to partner up with for um, a small motel hotel in a specific area of Los Angeles mm. um, and a specific area of uh, Orange County. So those are really rare to come by, and especially because people want like astronomical numbers, even uh, operating like crap. Um, we did find one in North Hollywood, and it just, the numbers did not make sense. Like we had to offer like 1.7, and these guys wanted like eight. So, mm. you know. Um, things like that make sense, but there's also like, you got to be careful to not get caught in that trap where it's like, just because the regulations, right. Going back to your question earlier, doesn't mean it's going to do well. And it doesn't, mm -hmm. because you might have 20 different motels in the area that are already boutique and it's still saturation within that space. Gotcha. But I'm not the one looking for them. I have my partners looking for them and they'll <laughs> let me know when you find them. That's smart. That's smart. So you talked a lot about um, networking a lot. So um, at your stage um, of your business, do you have a mentor that really helps you? Um, no, I don't have one mentor. I have multiple mentors. Um, just and all my mentors are like people I network with. Um, my business partners on the hotel up in Michigan, they're my men they've been huge mentors to me hmm. um, because I didn't care about acquisitions nor capital raising until I really started hanging out with them and getting to know them. Um, I didn't know any of that stuff, right? Um, and they've helped me learn and understand that aspect of real estate. Um, I had a mentor that helped me learn systems and processes when I first started. Uh, I haven't talked to him in years. Um, but no, not currently. I mean, 
the guy that runs my the legacy mastermind, Tim Bratz, he's kind of like an unofficial mentor because I get to hang out with them and he talks about bigger deals and it just kind of inspires me to do more. But I don't have someone that's like Rafa, do this, Rafa, do that. Hey, this is how we got. No. Gotcha. So you you mentioned the legacy mastermind. You said was that was your mastermind? No, that's it belongs to a guy named Tim Bratz. I'm just oh, part okay. of it. Oh, okay, gotcha. I thought it was yours. I was like, dude, plug that thing. I want to see. I want to hear about it. But all right. <laughs> so, uh, another thing uh, that we like to ask people, you know, uh, um, for the most part, we see whenever real estate investors usually big readers. And so, any sort of like big books in the past that have kind of made a big impact on you? Yeah, dude. So, um, Rich Dad Poor Dad, obviously. Um, that one's probably one of the the the. It's what got my wheels turning in terms of real estate. I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always had a bunch of businesses but never a real estate business. That one's what really got me going. Um, the second one is a book called Multipliers. It's a mm. how to how to train people and delegate and teach them to become their own people to help mm. you grow. Um, and then Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Um, I've read that book 60 times maybe just because it's a, like just, you know, callous of the mind. Um, don't worry about BS nonsense. And then um, the... Um, Love that. There's book. one right now. It's called uh Jesus, what's it called? It's called um The Same Guy that wrote Who Not How. Um Oh yeah, I heard he come out with a new book. I can't remember what it is off the man. It's such a good book here. I'll tell you guys what it's called right now. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, if, to, if you ever if you ever yeah, if you're ever like having a bad day and you th- you you like want to be whining about something, just like throw David Goggins in your ears on an audio book and you're like, Well, you know, like my day's actually not that bad. Yeah, literally, dude. It's such a good book. I, I make everybody read it. That's like, that's um, trying to learn or, you know, get into the game. I'm like, well, first you got to get your mindset straight. Read this book. Um, man, I don't, can't remember what it's called. Uh, I have it here on my phone somewhere. I don't want to delay it. Yeah, I, I knew Goggins was a, a psychopath, but I didn't know quite how far he was until, uh, until I read that book. It's like, dude, this guy's like running on broken legs and feet that are sliced up and he's a he's an animal the gap in the gain that's the name of the book yeah David Goggins is game. badass so gap in the gain gain is a really easy read really simple book a lot of people don't think it's great but i think it's awesome because again everybody's always chasing that wheel right trying to do bigger things and get get and they're never happy right you have a million dollars now you want 10 million dollars you have a hundred million dollars now you want a million a billion dollars i'm more of like okay how hard have i got how how far have i gotten in comparison to what i was doing last year and as long as I'm growing every single year, I'm happy and I get to enjoy that process, right? Um, that's nice. why I'm a big fan of that book. And that's why I'm more of like, hey, I'm just doing things that excite me now um, because it's kind of changed my mindset instead of just growing. Before it was like, I just want to add a bunch of doors and I want to add a bunch of units. But then it's like, dude, it comes with way more work, way more cost and way more time. Screw that. Let me just find what's good to make me excited, to make me money to the point where I want to get to. Um, and then the last book I want to throw in there is, um, uh, gosh darn it. I just had it on the top of my head. It's um by uh uh here, let me pull it up again. And everybody's got to read this if they haven't read it. It's another mindset. Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. Have you guys mm. read that? I have not read that. Bro, it is so good. And mm. I suggest you listen to it on Audible if it's even better. So anyway, uh, I went on a bunch of books there, but no, I love that, man. Yoni and I we're we're big book guys. We like it. So give give us like the the elevator pitch on the book. What's it about? Uh, so I wouldn't the double is a mindset book about basically, I don't want to say like overcoming your fears or overcoming your demons, but just get over your shit and just get to work. Yeah. Right? Love that. Um, there's a, and ignore the BS of, of other people like judging and keeping you down and, and you know, your friends and family judging you and all that other stuff. It's you focus on you and grind to do you to become a better person. That's cool, man. That. So, sounds a little, a uh, little bit in the same vein as uh, the War of Art. I'm sure you've read that one. That's a yeah, really good I book. Have. Long time ago, yeah. actually, I read that years ago. Yeah, I just just read it for the first time. Just finished it like maybe like three or four weeks ago. I was like, that's a, that's one that you just like pick up and randomly flip through, and you go to a spot and you're like, you just read something, and it just like puts everything into perspective. I love it. All right, and then last part of the uh, of the podcast, we ask: um, Is there anything that you know you're possibly lacking in business right now that listeners potentially could help you? Whether it's a hire, whether it's an acquisition, something you're looking for, and then what's the best way for everybody to get a hold of you? Yeah. So, um, in terms of the business, I'm always looking to grow the business. So, you know, if you, again, this is how I get my deals, anybody listening to it and you want to partner up on a deal and you need help with what I'm an expert in, you know, I'm open to chat. 
Um, if you find a deal that you're like, hey, this might be a good one. Let's partner up on it. I need your expertise on it. I'm in for it. I'm always looking to raise capital. I'm not actively raising capital. Like this isn't me telling people to give me money, but I'm always looking to raise capital. Um, that's pretty much everything that I need in terms of my business is is help with the bringing the deal flow and um, raising the private capital. Other than that, you guys can reach me on Instagram. It's my my one go-to spot. I'm not really active on Facebook. Um, Instagram is it's Rafa Loza, I-T-S Rafa Loza. That's it, man. Beautiful. Love it. Awesome. I appreciate you coming on, man. Yoni, you got anything else before we close them out? Um, no, this was awesome. I I learned a lot. And so, Rafa, we're going to be friends. Cool, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm glad I'm yeah. glad I was able to add value. For sure, dude. For sure. Yeah, we'll we'll have you back on once uh, once the ranch gets up and running and we want to get an update on it. Yeah, sounds good. All right, cool, man. We appreciate you coming on. All right, everybody. This has been another episode of the Fetch It Podcast, and we're going to see you guys next time. Peace.